glad that you're able to join us here on our YouTube channel here for Faith Baptist Church and to continue our study on the seven churches of Revelation. And we're going to be looking at the church of Ephesus here later in our service today. But first, just a couple of announcements as we get started this morning. I just want to give my thanks and appreciation to our church family for the love and compassion that you could share with one another in the food that we were able to send out by Boda Boda this week uh, to different families in our church that were needing some food and assistance. Thank you for being a part of that. If you missed out, you didn't know about the opportunity to give. If we do have any future ones, we would like to allow you that opportunity. If you uh, need to be involved and you weren't, if you didn't know about it, just send a text to us or call me here at the church and we'll be sure to make sure you know the next time that this happens. Uh, also, I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving your tithes and offerings. Our God has been faithful to us and providing for our needs, and we want to make sure we're faithful to Him in our tithes and our offerings, and also be praying about our missions project, printing the tracts for the Martyrs' Day coming up. As we give to those that come into our community for that event, we want to be able to have a gospel tract that we can give a clear presentation of the gospel, but something that they'll be willing to take as it pertains to that event of Martyr's Day. So we're looking forward to those things coming up. Lord willing, uh, that will all happen after this lockdown has expired. In the meantime, I'm thankful that we can meet together online, and I want to encourage you to make sure you're able to listen to the Tuesday evening messages. Pastor Tony is doing a great job teaching us through the book of James, and I hope you're able to listen to those and also to the prayer requests. It's so important for us to pray for one another. It's our privilege, our opportunity. It's the greatest thing that we can do for each other. And it's really one of the greatest privileges we have as a child of God. We can come into him before the throne and give our requests, and he welcomes us. Let's not miss uh, that privilege that we have of praying for one another. Uh, if the, the internet is too much consumption on the video, we do have the audio files available. You can find those at www.faith.ug forward slash audio. And then our videos are on faith.ug forward slash YouTube. So you can be sure to stay up with all of the services here at Faith Baptist Church. Well, as I mentioned this morning, we're continuing our study in the book of Revelation, looking at the church of Ephesus. So if you don't have your Bible, just pause the video, go and get your Bible. And now that you have your Bible, I want to ask you to open to Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 2 up to verse 4 this morning. Revelation 2, starting in verse 2, he says, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Well, there's a challenge there to the church of Ephesus, and we're going to look at that today, and I hope it will be a challenge to us as well. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our service this morning. Our Heavenly Father, you are great, and we praise you for being that wonderful Father. We thank you for your provision to us, uh, even beyond what we need so that we could share and give to the needs of others in our church, and in our community, and here across Uganda. So many people are having needs, and you are the provider that we trust, and we thank you for that. I thank you for giving us your word and for the lesson that we're going to learn today about this church of Ephesus and how it can affect us as your children today so that we can be the kind of church at Faith Baptist Church that you want us to be. Thank you for those that have listened and, and watched in our video and a part of the service today. I pray for those that don't have hope that they would find hope in Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're looking at uh, the seven churches of Revelation, and today we jump in on chapter 2 with the first church, and that is the church of Ephesus. Ephesus there, and, and we're calling it the loveless church, a church that once loved much, but now they're loving less. They're not loving the way they used to love, and God, as we saw in this first reading this morning in verse number 4, 
He's challenging them because they have left their first love. What does that mean? And how does that apply to us? Well, let's go ahead and get into this passage and see what God wants us to learn from his letter to the church of Ephesus. First, this morning, I want us to step back and, and look at the environment in which the church of Ephesus was ministering, the world around Ephesus. What was it like? Now, we're going back almost 2,000 years, so the world is going to be a little bit different then. And so as we look at Ephesus, first we want to look at it as a city. And Ephesus, the city of Ephesus, was down in the southwest corner of Asia, uh, just on the Aegean Sea. And uh, across that sea is Greece, the nation of Greece. If you, if you look at the map here, if you just go beyond the edge of the map, uh, to the left there, you'll get to Greece. And so the Greek Empire had been very great and had a lot of influence in the, the city of Ephesus. But now the Roman Empire has taken over. And so we have a mix of both Greek and Roman influences in that city. And so that affected the culture, the culture of the city. And so when we think of the culture, one of the things that we think of, of course, is their religion. Well, the Greeks had a god named Artemis, and that was a goddess of fertility. The Romans named that same god Diana. And if you think with me back to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 19, you'll remember when Paul and his companions came into the city of Ephesus. And the people in that city cried for two hours, Great is Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. They were very devout in their religion, in their worship. They had built a temple to the goddess Diana, or Artemis as they knew her at that time, that false god, but they built a temple to her in 500 B.C. Well, now we're coming up almost to 100 B.C., which means that temple had stood for almost 600 years by the time that uh, John is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. That's a long time to maintain a structure, a building. Now, today we can't find uh, exactly where that temple was. There are some ruins that archaeologists have uncovered. They believe that could have been the temple. But that place that they found was right next door to a theater. And that theater they have identified. That theater could seat 25,000 people. 25,000 people. Now, the, that gives us an idea of the architecture of their culture. And their architecture was very much influenced by their religion. They had this great temple to the goddess Diana, and either connected to it or immediately beside it was a theater which would seat 25,000 people. Now, Mandela National Stadium seats almost 45,000 people, so that's much larger. But if you've had the opportunity to attend some football matches, maybe at St. Mary's Stadium or Nakibubo Stadium, uh, those are around the size of this theater in the city of Ephesus. But this is 2,000 years ago, seating 25,000 people. Now that theater would have been used for any events that would gather the people of the city together. In Acts chapter 19, we see Paul's companions being, being arrested, basically, and drawn into that theater and, and a hasty trial set up. And they begin accusing them of blaspheming their false god, Diana. Well, in that event, as they're seated there, the people of the city pouring into that theater, defending their goddess, Diana. Then the town clerk comes in and, and calms the people down, and he says, people, men and brethren, you know... There's not a man around that doesn't know that Ephesus is devoted to the goddess Diana, that is a worshiper of the goddess Diana. That's what the city was known for. And that's the culture that, that this church is ministering to here when John is writing this letter. The culture of that city was a pagan, idolatrous city that rejected Jehovah God and worshiped this goddess of fertility, very immoral worship, of this goddess Diana. Well, that leads us to the ministry of that church in Ephesus, the, the Ephesian church. Historical documents and traditions tell us that John the Apostle did pastor in this church at one time. I'm assuming that would be before his arrest and his imprisonment on the Isle of Patmos. And so there was a time that, that John was pastoring this church. They had a great foundation of faith. 
And uh, we'll see that as we go through here in just a moment and look at the ministry of the church of Ephesus. The Apostle John, Paul's influence as he came through, that apostolic influence gave them a foundation of faith built on love for one another and love for God himself. And we're going to see how that is what God is trying to bring them back to, a love for him and a love for others. Well, that's the world in which the, the Ephesian church was ministering. So let's go and look at the works of the church, the works of the church. And we see that here starting in verse number two, which we read already this morning. And he says, I know thy works. We have two words here, works and labor. And in our modern English, those are very similar. But at this time, they were, they were a little bit different in those Greek words. The work there, that, that is an idea of toil, toil, what we would normally think of laboring today. We hire laborers. But, but the idea there is, is a physical work where they are working out some things as, as we are told to work out our salvation, to show it, to put feet to our faith. And that's the idea here. This city was a central hub during Paul's missionary journeys. As he would come through Asia Minor, and as he looked ahead into Greece, remember when he was called to go to Macedonia? As he would pass through Asia, Ephesus was a place that was like a crossroads for him, a hub of his ministry. And so there we see in the past they had that, that labor, that work, that toiling, where they would care for Paul as he came through, and they would also be effective in ministering in their city. Again, a very wicked pagan city that needed the light of the hope of Jesus Christ. And the Ephesus church, the Ephesians there, those Christians, they were actively sharing their faith with others. And so we see in the past they had been working. We see in verse 3, he says, Thou hast borne. That's the idea of a burden. You've carried this message to other places. So he says, I know your past toil. You have carried these things. And we also see that you have not fainted, that they had worked, they had been tiresome in the ministry that God had given to them. That was in the past. Well, where are they now? What have they been doing now? What brought them from the past up to the present? And that's the word labor here in this verse. I know thy works and thy labor. That word labor has the idea of a woman who is in labor delivering a child. There is joy mixed with pain. It is the idea of pain or trouble, and that's the word labor. Why, why is Paul using this word? Well, the Christians were under some severe persecution during this first century of the church. So they had opposition for preaching the gospel. But the church also had opposed those that were evil. We see that in verse 3. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Thou canst not bear them which are evil. So now, even up to the present, he's encouraging them, there are some things you're doing well. You used to work hard for the gospel. You carried that burden. And even up to now, when you see false doctrine, you fight against it. Even when there's pain, even when there's opposition, you are laboring for the sake of the gospel. Still in verse 6, he says, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So it, now they are resisting this false doctrine called the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What is that? Well, the best we can see from history and, and tradition and from Scripture, there are some historical documents that believe this came from a man named Nicholas, one of the first uh, deacons in the church in Jerusalem. But as he continued to serve, now we're several decades later in the timeline of history, uh, probably about 50 to 60 years later, and so there had been... There, there's this idea that had spread through some groups of Christians that it doesn't really matter what we're involved with as long as we're not participating in evil. And specifically where that came to light for the Nicolaitans was in eating the meat that had been offered to the false gods, offered in the temples of the idols. Now Paul had told people earlier, if you don't know where the meat came from, then you eat what is set before you. But if somebody tells you, 
this is the meat from the idol worship in the temple, then we should refuse that meat because we're saying, I approve of the action of that idol worship. I'm participating in it, not directly, but indirectly participating because I'm supporting it by knowingly consuming that meat, which means I'm encouraging that person to buy that meat which was offered to idols. Why would they do that? Well, what is offered to the, to the God? The best. And so they would say, this is the cheapest way to get the best meat. We're going to get this because we don't believe that idols are real, so it's, it's fine for us to do that. But what was happening is when they buy that meat, they're supporting that industry of the idol worship. How does that apply to us today? Well, whenever there is something sinful, we need to be careful that we are not directly participating or supporting that. Now, there are times that we can be involved and we don't realize that the support is getting back to it. For example, if I shop at a particular lockup and the owner of that lockup is, is somebody of a, of a different religion and he's supporting that religion, I'm not buying from him because of that. I might not be aware that he supports a false religion, but if he tells me, please buy from me, the more you buy from me, the more I give to this false God, I'm probably not going to keep buying from him. It, it, we could apply it to, to sports betting or any gambling. Uh, some people say, I'm going to participate in these things just as recreation. I'm not trying to get rich. I'm still trusting God. And some people spend money on movies. Some people spend money watching football. Some people spend money on other activities. I just spend my recreation money on gambling because I enjoy the, the challenge. But what we have to realize is we're supporting that industry, which goes very much against the principles in the word of God. We need to be careful with our participation in things. And that's what was wrong with the Nicolaitans. They were supporting idol worship. And they said, it's okay because the meats don't have any, any demons in it. The, we're not worshiping those gods. So it's okay for us to support the industry as long as we don't participate. And God is saying, not only is it wrong, but notice what he says. Thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. God hates it when we participate or support anything that goes against his word or against his worship. And so that's what the, the Ephesians were doing well. They were fighting against these things that God hates. But we're going to see, as we saw earlier, that there's a warning which is coming with that. But still, he's encouraging them, your past work is great. Your present labor has been good, and you've even been patient. That's the next thing we see patient here in verses 2 and 3. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. Verse 3, thou hast borne, and hast patience. That word patience means cheerful endurance. Life was not necessarily easy for the Christians at this time. In the city of Ephesus, surrounded by all these worshipers of the goddess Diana, life was not easy. It wasn't easy to be a Christian. They had enduring times. They had times that they had to endure persecution, to endure opposition. But how did they endure it? This word means cheerful endurance. <laughs> Today we're in the midst of a lockdown. Uh, this coronavirus has really disrupted the whole world. How are we going to go through it? Are we going to complain? Or are we going to have cheerful endurance? See, our hope and our trust is in our God. He has saved us. He has redeemed us. He provides for us. And he's always good. We can trust him. We can have cheerful endurance. I've been encouraged by many of the things you've been posting on our WhatsApp group and on your status and in other places. Let's continue to have cheerful endurance as we go through this time showing our faith and our trust in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus was commending the church here in Ephesus. You've done well. You've had this patience. They were known for their love, as we see in the, in the book of Ephesians when Paul writes to them. He says, you've had love for the others. But now we're going to see that times are changing and God is going to challenge them. We've seen the world around Ephesus. We've seen the works of Ephesus. But now we're going to see the warning to Ephesus. This warning that God is giving to them in verses 4, 5, and 7. 
As we read earlier in verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. They've left their love. That's the complaint that we see. You've left your first love. What should be our first, our primary, our most important love? <laughs> it should be for Jesus Christ. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Then he also said, when you love me, you will love the brethren. You will love others. By this will all men know that you are my disciples when you have love one for another. Again, I was encouraged this week to see the love of our church family, that body, loving one another through the contributions for food this week. Oh, it's good to see the love. And I'm glad we have that love. I don't believe that, that God would give us this warning right now, but we can still be forewarned. We can be warned to beware so that we don't get to the point of the Ephesians. They once were known for their love, and, and when people heard about Ephesus, they'd say, that's a church that loves the brethren. But something happened. Something changed. And now he's saying, you've left your first love. As their love for God reduced, their service to God and their unity reduced as well. When we don't have love for others, when people look at us, they say, is that a Christian? And that's not what God wants. They want people to see Christ in us. God wants to see Christ in us, so others will see that. In Hebrews chapter 6, in verses 10 and 11, we are reminded here that our God is always watching, and He sees and knows everything. Hebrews 6, verses 10 and 11, He says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward His name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. God sees when we have love for others. He also sees when we lack love for others. And so Hebrews here is encouraging us, continue, do the same diligence to show hope up to the end. When we show love to one another, it demonstrates, it shows others, I have a hope which is beyond the current situation. I have a hope for the future in Jesus Christ. And that's what God is watching. He sees when we have love, and he sees when we don't have love. And so he is always watching us. Remember what he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I where? In the midst of them. Go back with me and read in verse one. We skipped that earlier. Unto the church and the angel of unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. God walks through the midst of our church. Not the building here in Chaliwandula. We are the church. He lives in us and he walks in our midst. He walks with us. He says he will never leave us nor forsake us. And then he says he's holding those stars, those pastors. If you were in our Bible study this morning, you saw how those stars refer to the pastors of the church. Just as every believer, he holds in his hand. And no one is able to pluck them out of his hand. We are safe and we are secure in his hand. But he walks in the midst of us. He's seeing when we are in church, when, when Lord willing, soon we'll be able to meet back together again. He sees if our love for one another is genuine or if it's fake. He wants us to have that genuine love. He's given us his love, and he wants us to show that love to others. Well, the complaint that he had for the church of Ephesus was that they didn't have genuine love, but they used to. You've left your first love. So he gives them a correction. I'm so thankful that when God complains, when he tells us something's wrong, he shows us in Scripture how to make it right. And that's what we see in verse number 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Two things there. He says, remember and repent. First, remember, he says, remember from whence thou art fallen. This is not talking about salvation. We can't fall out of his hand. He holds us. If we could fall out, it would mean he dropped us. And he cannot lose us. No one can pluck us out of his hand. 
This is not about salvation. This is a fall from our effectiveness, a failure in our effectiveness. When we don't look like Jesus Christ, God doesn't want to put us out there for others to see. This is what I look like. If I'm involved in sin, if I'm involved in complaining, murmuring, disputing, dividing the church, if I am not loving others and loving God as I'm supposed to, why does God want to put me out as an example? He's saying there's a correction here. Remember from whence you fall. You used to have an opportunity to serve many. But now you've left your first love. You've fallen from that opportunity of effectiveness. They fell from showing in love. But notice, they did not fall from receiving love. In Romans 8, we know these verses, and I love them, and I want to read them again so we get them clearly. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the what, church? The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hey, we can never fall from receiving God's love. In fact, it's God's love which caused him to correct the church here in Ephesus. Whom the Lord loveth, he chastens. He's going to correct. He's going to reprove. And that's exactly what he's doing here to the church in Ephesus. Even when we fail to love others, we don't fail to receive God's love. His love is constant. It is sure. And that is the power that gives us the power to love others. Because we're receiving his love, we can love others also. Well, the correction here first, they need to remember from whence they are falling and then he, fallen. And then he says, and repent and do the first works. The word repent there is to change a direction. He said, you've been going away from love. You need to turn around and come back to love. Go back and do what you haven't been doing. Reverse your course. Change your direction. Turn back and do what you've stopped doing. Resume could be another word that we could look at there. Resume the love that you've missed. Well, this is a warning. He's given them a, cor a complaint and he's given them a correction. But along with that, he warns them of the consequence the consequence if they fail to remember and to repent. And we see that in verse number five. He says, return, uh, remember, I'm sorry, and then repent and do the first works or else, this is the consequence, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Now, who is he speaking about here? He's talking to thee, to thou, it's a singular pronoun referring to one individual, and that's the star of the church in Ephesus. That's the pastor. The pastor is held accountable for what happens in the church. And he's saying, I'm warning you, go back and resume what you've been doing, or I'm going to remove the candlestick out of its place. Well, the candlestick there, the candlestick is the, is the church. The star is the pastor. And so in, in chapter 1, in verse 20, we see that the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, that's the pastors, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. God is warning here that the church, the candlestick, is going to be removed out of its place. He's not saying, I'm going to take you out from being pastor. He's saying, I'm going to take the church out of Ephesus. Why? Why would God do that? Well, if a church no longer looks like Jesus Christ, he doesn't want his name associated with it there. The church of Ephesus had a very challenging environment. We saw the culture, a very pagan, idolatrous culture. And if they had begun to, to join in worldly activities or even worldly attitudes, what hope are they going to have? Jude 22 tells us, and of some have compassion, making a difference. If we are not different from the world around us, what hope is there? Are they going to look to us and say, there's something different about you. You have a hope that I don't have. You have a peace that I don't have. You have a love that I don't have. If we're not showing them love, hope, and peace, 
what opportunity will we have to share the hope of eternal life, which is found in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the love of God that never is separated from us. If we don't live it out, others aren't going to be drawn to Christ through us. And he's saying, if you don't change, I'm going to take the church out of Ephesus. It doesn't mean the church is destroyed. It just means they won't be meeting together in Ephesus. He's challenging them. You have a ministry to these people. You need to change course. You need to return back to the first works of love. Or I'm going to disperse this church. I'm going to spread it out. And there won't be a church in Ephesus. Today, there is no church in that city of Ephesus. There hasn't been for centuries. Evidently, they didn't respond to the message. Or if they did, maybe later they failed once again. But there's no church in Ephesus today. They've been dispersed. Neighboring towns have churches and bodies of believers, but in Ephesus, in that historic city, there's not. I will remove the candlestick out of its place. This shows the importance of pastoral leadership to lead well. And pray for your pastors. We need God's wisdom. We need your prayers. We seek his counsel. We seek his direction to move forward in a way that glorifies God. Not just now, but to prepare our church for the future. That's why we want to teach the word of God, because it's this foundation that will help us to continue to stand on truth, to have our faith rooted and grounded in love and in the word of God, so we can grow and bear fruit for his glory. Well, we see the consequence that he warned. And finally, here in chapter, in, in chapter 2, verse 7, we see a call that he gives out. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. There's a call. There's a welcome. Whoever will hear, then listen what I'm saying to the churches. That's for us. This message is still for us today. No, we're not Ephesus. This is Chaliwajala, Namagongo. But the message for the church is still a message that we can be warned today not to go into these ways of abandoning love. Oh, we need to be like Ephesus where we don't accept false doctrine, where we fight against those that would want to bring in as liars and, and as he approved their actions for what they were doing. But let us not be like those that have lost the first love. Here it says, to all who hear, there is a call to overcome. What does that mean? To reject lies and believe the truth of God's word. Oh, when we start to, to believe lies that come in through the world's systems of, of media, of books, of friends, neighbors, even family members, it can pull us away from the word of God. And when we believe a lie, we've rejected truth. When we overcome lies, that's when we believe truth. But how will we know it when we study the word of God? Jesus' prayer to the Father for you and for me is that we would be sanctified, that we would be set apart from the world's ways by thy truth. And he said, God's word is that truth which will give us the power to overcome those lies. Jesus has defeated sin. He's defeated Satan. He's defeated lies and the devil. We are free. But we don't live in freedom when we believe lies. But to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life. The greatest lie the devil has is that you can't be saved, that you cannot have eternal life. But here Jesus promises that you will eat of the tree of life if we overcome. That doesn't mean we stop sinning. It means we believe the truth. What is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. To everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ as the payment for their sin, because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, and in Jesus Christ only for that salvation, they are born into God's family. They are made a child of God. They are placed in His hand where He holds us secure forever, and nothing can separate us from his love. To him that overcomes, he will make to eat in the paradise of God. He says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat.
to eat. It's not up to me to get there. He is the one that will make us eat in that paradise of God, in that forever eternal life with our Heavenly Father and with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you have that life today? Do you have that hope? Oh, it's a glorious hope. It's a wonderful life, and it's an eternal life, and it's a free gift. If you've never received it as a free gift, I urge you to contact us. We'd love to show you from the Bible how you can receive that gift of eternal life. It's God's promise. It's not mine, but I can show you his promise so that you can receive it. Please contact us through our email, through our website, or through our phone number. All of those are included in the notes for this video on YouTube. For those of you listening online, the phone number is 0776-00-0014. We would love to show you how you can receive that eternal life. Believers, fellow Christians, members of Faith Baptist Church, how about us? What is this warning for us? Can we be careful to beware, not to let dissension come in, not to let things come in that can divide the unity? I love the fellowship and the unity that we have. It is a family. And I look forward to being back together with my church family when this lockdown is over. But when we come, let's be careful that we have a genuine love for all the body of Christ. I don't want to be corrected like this church in Ephesus. You've left your first love. I love my church. And I want that love to grow more and more so that people look at us and say, there's something you have which I don't. And the simple answer is, I've received the love of God, and I'm just sharing that love with others. Oh, what a glorious God we have. What a glorious gift we have of his life and the privilege that we have to love one another. I hope this series through the, the book of Revelation and these seven churches will continue to be an encouragement to you. Uh, we've just started the first church, and we're going to cover this over the next few weeks. Uh, but I encourage you to, to make sure we stay tuned and watch every lesson so we get every message that God wants to have for us. God bless you. Thank you for watching. I'm praying for you. And if we can be of help to you, please contact your pastoral leadership here at Faith Baptist Church.